Hello everybody! Happy New Year! Happy 2024! I hope that your holiday season was magical, that you had a wonderful New Year, and that 2024 is the start of your best year yet. I am obviously out here in my common area, so I apologize if there are a lot of background noises going on, like my dryer, which is currently running. Laundry is never ending. But I just wanted to come on here really quickly and open the vlog and share with you some exciting bookish mail that I got a couple of days ago, but I haven't opened yet because I was waiting to share it with y'all. It is the fairy loot ultra special exclusive editions of the red rising trilogy so i'm gonna go ahead and unbox those here with you but you're actually standing on them so i'm gonna have to move you around but first i just kind of wanted to really quickly update you on what's happening reading wise so in just a few minutes i actually plan on sitting down and starting fourth wing by rebecca yaros that is going to be the fantasy that i read physically for the month of january and because i don't know how long it's going to take me i'm giving myself the whole month to finish it if i do finish it earlier than the end of january I am going to be picking up another fantasy or sci-fi. In my TBR, I mentioned potentially going ahead and picking up Red Rising. That is still a strong possibility, especially since I have these beautiful books and I want to make sure that I want to keep them. But also, I'm kind of dying to finish Throne of Glass. I have been procrastinating on it because I know that the end of the series is probably going to gut me and I think I just kind of need to rip off the band-aid. But that is a chunky, chunky book and I have to be in the right mindset. So we're going to see. But Fourth Wing for sure is the plan. In terms of audiobook, right now, I think I'm leaning towards Last One at the Party by Bethany Clift. That is the sci-fi dystopian that was recommended to me by Nana, one of my subscribers, as part of the Read Like My Subscribers project that I'm currently doing. I think it's going to be a good idea to start with that book because I know nothing about it. I have zero expectations for it. And so I think if I end up not loving it, it's not going to put a big, huge damper on my reading year as if, say, I started with a highly anticipated book and didn't love it. But I have not yet started it. So we're going to see how that goes. So no real official reading updates at this point because I haven't actually started anything so far in 2024. All right, so that's the reading update. Let me go ahead and open this box and I will share the pretty books with you. Hi, Nola. <laughs> um, Nola. Hi, baby. Nola. Nola decided to join us, as you can see by the blackout that happened on the camera. Okay, so I have the books out of the package. Let me go ahead and unwrap them because this is going to be loud, and then I'll show you. All right, so here is Red Rising, and I just think that it's stunning. It fits the vibes of the story so much, and if you're shaking, it is because Nola is right here shaking the whole table, so I apologize about that. Here is the cover. Here are the sprayed edges. Here is the back. What does that say? The measure of a man is what he does when he has power. Here is the naked hardcover. Beautiful red foiling, also on the spine, and there is the back. Here is the front and papers. And of course, it is signed by Pierce Brown. I've mentioned this before, but I do plan on rereading Red Rising to see if I enjoy it more than I did the first time back in 2017 because I am now a very, very different reader. So we're going to see if I do enjoy it more, I will plan on continuing in the series and I will keep these beautiful editions. But if not, then I will probably end up selling these, unfortunately. Okay, here is Morningstar. I believe this is book two. I could be wrong. I don't know what order they go in, but here is Morningstar. Sprayed edges, I think, are pretty much almost exactly the same. There's the back and this one says, forget a man's name and he'll forgive you. Remember it and he'll defend you forever. Here is the naked hardcover, gorgeous blue foiling. There's the spine. There is the back. Here are the front end pages and there are the back end pages. All right. And then here is golden sun. There's the spine. There's the back. This one home isn't where you're from. It's where you find light when all goes dark. There are the sprayed edges. This is the naked foiling on there. There's the spine. There's the back. Ooh, I like this one. She is fierce. Look at that. And then there's the back end pages on that one. So these are stunning. I absolutely love them. That's why I decided to pick them up. I'm just hoping that I love the series. So, all right, y'all. There's the reading updates. There's the happy mail. And now I think I'm going to go ahead and sit down and read a little bit of Fourth Wing. So let's go. <music>
everybody. It is January 2nd and I am officially back to work today. Not super thrilled about it. I have a lot of mixed emotions going in today, but before I got the day started, I wanted to come on here and give you a reading update because I actually made some good progress yesterday in the first two books of the new year. So I did start Fourth Wing yesterday and I actually made it 100 pages in and I'm very surprised by that. It's been a really long time since I've just sat down and tore through a book. It wasn't all in one sitting. It was over the course of like two or three sittings, but the fact that I made it through a hundred pages is astonishing to me and I am really really enjoying it. So from what I'm able to gather this follows our main character Violet Sorengale and her mom I don't know her official title but she is basically the leader of Beskyeth War College and this is a college where every young person goes to study for three years kind of master their chosen profession if you will. There are four quadrants there's healer quadrant, scribe quadrant, infantry quadrant, and writer quadrant and the writer quadrant is basically dragon riders. That's definitely the most dangerous now, Violet has basically trained her whole life to be in the scribe quadrant, but her mom will not let her. She says a Sorengale is not going to be a scribe. A Sorengale is always a writer. But the problem is, is that Violet was affected by an illness, I think, when she was in the womb. And that leaves her kind of very weak and susceptible to injury. And her likelihood of survival is very, very low. But she's going to do it because her mother has told her and she's not going to back down. So the first hundred pages, you're kind of following her as she's entering the war college. She's getting acclimated to being a cadet in the writer quadrant. We haven't really met the dragons yet or really gotten further into that, but I'm just enjoying it overall. We've met basically, I think, all of the main players. We've met Dane, who is in his second year of being in the writer quadrant and who is Violet's best friend. He's very, very protective of her. He does not want her to be there, and he's basically spending this entire time trying to get her to go back to Scribe Quadrant. Then you're meeting a boy named Zane who actually wants to kill Violet because I guess there was a big rebellion amongst a lot of the people, and Violet's mother sentenced all of them to death, and all of their children are conscripted into the writer quadrant. So they have no choice. They're the only non-volunteers in the writer quadrant. And so there's a lot of hostility against Violet for being her mother's daughter. And so I think we're going to be following Violet as she's having to overcome a lot physically, mentally, emotionally. And I'm here for it. I'm really, really enjoying it so far. I don't necessarily know if I'm going to be as enamored with it as everybody else is. But the fact that I flew through 100 pages is really telling as to how much I'm enjoying the story. And then the official first book of the year on audiobook that I'm listening to purely is called Morgan is My Name by Sophie Keach and it follows basically the early life of Morgan Le Fay. Now this is a historic character that again I had never heard of before but I guess she is said to be King Arthur's half-sister and she's said to be a notorious villain in history. I had never heard of her before so I'm going into this completely blind. I have no idea who she's supposedly turned out to be so I'm really going into this with like a clean slate with regard to who she is but this first book is definitely following her from a young age when her father the Duke of Cornwall is brutally killed by the King of Britain and the King of Britain basically forces Morgan's mother to marry him and so she becomes a princess of Britain. She's not happy about it. She does not like King Uther Pendragon and she has to endure a lot and then she's eventually sent away to like this nunnery but in this nunnery she's allowed to learn. She's allowed to learn a lot of things and in this place she's kind of discovering her penchant for healing and it seems like she might be kind of diving into what are considered dark magics but I'm not entirely sure yet but that is where I am. I want to say now that I've listened to roughly about four hours total. So two hours of listening time because I listen on two times speed. And overall, I'm enjoying it. It hasn't necessarily emotionally captured me, but I am interested in the story. I'm liking the atmosphere and the vibes. This is definitely a time period that is outside of my comfort zone for sure. You know, Arthurian and Merlin times, it's not something that I typically read about. And I'm interested to see how Morgan progresses as a character. I do believe that this is a trilogy. I, of course, don't know at this point whether or not I would continue with the trilogy, but I assume you're basically going to follow her entire life so maybe it becomes like a villain origin story which is very intriguing to me but you know right now of course she's nowhere near that and of course as I said because I've never heard of her before I don't have the context so I don't know like where she supposedly ends up but I'm enjoying learning about it so far the writing is great and I'm definitely intrigued so so far both reads are going really really well I will not finish Morgan is my name tonight but I will definitely finish it tomorrow and be on to the next read of my TBR so that's it y'all that's the update I guess I should bite the bullet and get this day started. I have a lot of things to do, so I'm going to go ahead and head in, and I will check in with you a little bit later. Hello, everybody. I am once again in my car outside of work waiting to go in. In all honesty, this is probably going to be one of the main places that I provide you updates in these vlogs because it's one of the only times and places I know that I can give you updates that's going to have good lighting and no interruptions for the most part. So I'm sorry about that. I will try to be as varied as possible. But I did want to come on here and give you an update because I have officially finished my very first book of the year, and that's 
that book was Morgan Is My Name by Sophie Keach. And I believe in a previous clip, I did discuss more on what this book is actually about, but it essentially follows the early life of Morgan Le Fay, who from my understanding is kind of a well-known villainess. She is the half-sister of famed King Arthur. And in this book, you're following her from the time when she's about seven years old, when she loses her father, to I want to say she's probably about 30 in her early 30s at the end of the story and all of the things that she endures in between those times. For the most part, I feel like I had a really pleasurable reading experience with this book. I was definitely charmed by Morgan and her life and I enjoyed learning about it from start to finish. I will say that there were parts of the story that could be quite slow and did lose me in terms of engagement. It kind of reminded me in those instances of my experience reading Circe by Madeline Miller, which I did not enjoy all that much. I know that's a very beloved book, but it's not one that really worked for me. I will say that this one definitely worked a lot more for me. I felt a lot more connected to Morgan's story, but there were those slow aspects that did lose me. And just in general, like retellings and things like that are not necessarily my thing. So I'm kind of debating between like a 3.5 and a four stars. And I think I'm going to allow myself a day or two to kind of figure out how I fully feel. And I want to try to do that in general in 2024, because I've noticed that I will go back and look at ratings that I've given books and just realize that I rated them too high or too low even, you know, maybe that I've just changed my mind about the book. And so I really want to allow myself time to think about how I feel. I definitely think that this book was very well written. Like I said, I found myself very charmed by Morgan's story and invested in Morgan's story. I don't think that it was a mad book. I don't think it was a forgettable read at all, but I also didn't feel like an emotional connection to it. So it's definitely not something that would receive a much higher rating than a 3.5 four stars. So ultimately though, I'm very glad I read it. I'm very glad that I got to experience Morgan's story. I don't think I would be continuing in the series, although I am kind of curious to see how it all turns out. So I don't know. I haven't officially made a determination on whether or not I'm going to continue. I do believe that probably the later books in this, I think it's going to be a trilogy, would be a little bit more action packed. I feel like this first book is probably a lot more set up than it is anything. So we're going to see. But like I said, I'm very glad I read it. And this is not only the very first book of 2024 done, but it is the very first book in the Reading Like My Subscribers Challenge done. And I'm actually now on to book number two, which is called Last One at the Party by Bethany Clift. I started it last night and I am really enjoying this one y'all. So this book was written I believe in 2021 and it's actually set in our current present day. Like the story opens in like October of 2023 and the world has basically been ravaged by a pandemic that is worse than COVID-19. COVID-19 is actually something that was lived through in this story but in this story what they're experiencing is much deadlier. So basically think of COVID-19 but with an automatic death sentence. Like everybody who gets this disease is automatically dead in six days. There's no cure, there's no vaccine, and the government has now actually issued pills for people to take to end their own lives because there's just no cure. Everything, of course, is chaos, and this is following our main character. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. I don't think we've heard it very often because this book is told entirely in her first-person perspective, but she is narrating her experience from when the first outbreak in London happened to her current situation where she is actually the only surviving person in London. And we don't know yet why she's the only surviving person in London. We don't know what makes her immune. We don't know if there's anybody else in the world at all at this point. I still feel like I'm pretty early days in the story. It's not a very long book. It's only about 10 hours on audio, which means about five hours of listening time. So I still feel like there's a lot of answers to come, or at least I hope there are a lot of answers to come. This may be one of those books where you don't get any kind of resolution, which is fine. You know, this is one of those very uncertain kind of situations, but it's also a book that makes you think, and it makes you think about how you would handle the situation. Like, what would you do if you woke up and you were the last person in the world? And so like I said, this is told entirely from our main character's first person perspective and you're following her in the present day as she's the only one in London, but you're also following her as she's telling you about her life and the people in it. You know, her parents, her husband who has recently died of the disease, her best friend who has also died, like basically everybody in her life has died and how she's coping and what that means for her and what she's going to do now that she is the only one. Like what does life look like when you are the only person left? I really like the way that it's written. I like the thought provoking nature of it and I'm just having a really good time. This one shouldn't take me too long to finish. I will probably finish it tomorrow at some point and move right along but so far so good all right everybody that is the update i've got to head into work but i will give you more reading updates as i have them
sorry for the bad lighting. It is almost 9 o'clock p.m. here, but I wanted to come on here and give you an update because I'm not sure how much time I'm actually going to have to do that tomorrow because tomorrow I actually am doing a CrossFit competition. It's nothing major. It's a very small competition from a very small gym. It's the very first one that they're doing. One of my CrossFit friends talked me into it. She is a big competitor. She competes all of the time. She's a very serious CrossFit athlete, and she really wanted to do this one for some reason. Anyway, I basically have to wake up at like a normal time, like I would wake up to go to work so that I could be there for sign in. And then it's basically an all day thing. There are four different workouts. It's going to be quite a long day. And so I really don't know if I'm going to have an opportunity to update y'all or even get any reading done, but I do have reading updates for you. So that's why I wanted to come on here. So I actually just finished Last One at the Party by Bethany Clift. And I actually really enjoyed it. I don't know if I mentioned this in the past clip, but the entire story is essentially told as if our main narrator is kind of dictating her life story via like a tape recorder. So she is trying to document what is happening in the world as well as her life. So you're getting a lot of snippets of her relationship with her husband, her best friends, her parents. It is definitely a very character driven story. I did find out that she remains unnamed throughout the entirety of the story. So we don't ever actually learn her name. And basically when she's not like flashing back to the past to talk about her life, it's covering the period from right when the pandemic hit to the end of the story, which spans, I would say roughly around 11 months or so. And like I said, I really enjoyed it. I found myself pretty captivated with the story because of its thought provoking nature. It really did make me think how I would react in this situation. Now I will say one of my biggest criticisms about the story was I found the main character to be quite unlikable overall. She was a very flawed individual. I would even go so far to say that she was very weak, selfish, and self-indulgent. She made a lot of really poor decisions during this time. And while I can definitely not say for certain how I would react if something so serious as to be one of the only lone survivors, I cannot say how I would truly react, but I would like to believe that I wouldn't be as self-indulgent as her, as kind of pitiful as her. I would like to believe that I would rally a little bit quicker and really try to be productive and try to survive to the best of my ability. She is in a really unique position in the story because it's not like The Walking Dead where there are still quite a lot of people who have survived and they're all competing for resources. She is literally the only one left and so she has all of these resources available to her. She can walk into any store and get anything that she needs. Now of course the food is eventually going to dwindle and things like that so that's a problem that she has to solve but for the most part she can get absolutely everything else that she needs and even though I didn't really agree with a lot of what she did it was really interesting to see the choices that she made and like I said you are also finding out a lot about her past and her history with her husband and best friend and things like that so overall I like the way that it's told and I will say that if you have the opportunity to listen to this via audio I would highly recommend it is very good especially because of the way that the story is being told to you like she is kind of dictating her life story and there were definitely parts where the narrator really gets into it and like she's really acting and stuff like that so I will say that there was a very abrupt ending that I wasn't necessarily expecting but at the same time I'm not really sure how else Bethany Clift could have ended the story. There was definitely a little bit of closure at the end in some ways but I do still feel like there could have been a little bit more given to us if that makes sense. So that was positive. Thank you so much Nana for recommending that story. I now have two subscriber recommendations down and I'm almost finished with the third. I am actually very close to finishing fourth wing. I only have 100 pages left and so far I'm having a very good time while reading it still. I will say that the pacing is a little bit off in some places for me. Like I feel like it's dragging a little bit more in the middle but now that we're getting towards the end it's going to pick up again and I will say that I'm a little bit annoyed with the main character Violet and how much she ogles Zayden. Like she is constantly talking about how hot he is and how she can't take her eyes off of him and all of that. And that to me is a little bit annoying. It's a little bit very YA, but we have definitely now gotten to the point where Violet is a writer. She has her bonded dragon. She has telepathic abilities with her dragon and the dragons are able to channel powers through their writers. And so I've just kind of gotten to the point where she's discovered what her signet power is. It's definitely along the lines of like a chosen one trip. I think I might've mentioned it before, but she has this sickness about her that kind of makes her weak. And so a lot of people are thinking that she's not going to survive. Dane, her best friend, is certain that she's not going to survive. He's very overly protective. He's trying to get her to leave. And so she's the least likely person to survive. But of course, she is surviving and she's thriving. And now basically the most powerful dragon has bonded with her. And you find out more about why that is in the story. This definitely has like a chosen one type of trip going on. And I'm not mad about it. I'm just having a good time. I'm enjoying the ride. It's not amazingly written or anything like that, but I do really enjoy the story so far. It's definitely fast paced. It is definitely very engaging. Like it'll keep the pages turning. It will keep you interested. I know it's suddenly super quiet because my washing machine stopped, but yeah, that's the reading update. So far, so good. I have now just started The Frozen River by Ariel Lahan. That was not originally on my TBR for this month. However, it was a hold for my life.
library. It was a December book of the month selection and y'all know I try to read those as I can when they come in. So I'm going to take a break from my TBR to read that book and then I will get back into it. I did also want to mention that one of the challenge pulls was to read a book that was character driven and so I had selected When We Were Bright and Beautiful for that. I don't think I'm going to use that. I think I'm going to go ahead and use Morgan is My Name because that was a very character driven story. So I'm not going to read When We Were Bright and Beautiful for my TBR and in fact I think I might just go ahead and unhaul it. I'm really not excited to read it and I don't think I have been excited to read it for a while so I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of it but I haven't officially made that determination but I'm not going to read it for January's TBR that's for sure. All right everybody I've been rambling for so long. I have some things that I definitely need to take care of before I go to bed tonight and it's already way later than I need it to be so I will check in with you when I have more reading updates. <music> Hey friends, so it is currently Sunday morning, January 7th. I am getting ready to film a video, but I wanted to pop on here really quick and give you a reading update. I think the last reading update I gave, I had mentioned that I had just started The Frozen River by Ariel Lahan, and I'm a little bit of a ways in. I think I'm about 30 plus percent of the way into it, and I can give you a better idea of overall what it's about. Again, I'm reading The Frozen River by Ariel Lahan. This is a historical fiction that is actually set in, I think it's 1789 in America. So it is like post-revolutionary time. America is a very brand new country and we're following our main character Martha Ballard who is a midwife. She is a respected midwife and healer in their town. She's always the one that everybody goes to when they're about to have a baby or if they're having medical ailments and things like that and she notes everything that happens in a journal that she keeps that was given to her by her husband and we find out near the start of the story that a few months prior to the start of the story she was called to the aid of a woman by the name of Rebecca Foster if I'm remembering her name correctly. She is actually the wife of the local preacher. Rebecca states that she was raped and you can just see the physical evidence all over her and she named two men as her attacker and of course rape is very hard to prove even today and even today there's still a huge stigma against it and a lot of women don't come forward and even when they do come forward nothing really happens to their attacker so you can just imagine what it was like in 1789. But the men that she accused are actually very powerful people. One of them is a current colonel and judge so at this point nothing has actually happened to them but Martha is determined to get justice for this woman and so I'm currently at the point where she is going to testify on behalf of this woman but also what's going on is that one of the men who was claimed to have raped this woman was recently found dead in a frozen river and Martha has told everybody that she thinks that he was brutally murdered but the other man that was accused of raping the woman who is also the judge he is basing his opinions on a medical doctor that recently came into town who is like flaunting his pedigree he's from Harvard Medical School and so like everybody is trusting his opinion and that man says that the guy who died was not killed the brutal state of his body was caused by nothing more than, you know, him falling into the river and being caught up in frozen branches and rocks and things like that. So nobody is even believing that he was murdered. But Martha believes that he was murdered. Martha also believes that this could have something to do with the rape. She is determined to figure out what happened to this man and also get justice for the woman that was raped. And so far, I'm really, really enjoying it. I love our main character, Martha. She is a spitfire. She is not afraid to stand up for herself and to stand up for what is right. She is, I believe, in her, like, mid-50s at this point of the story and and she's got several children of her own. She's a very wise and learned woman. And like I said, she's a very trusted midwife and healer in this town. And so I'm very much rooting for her. I have a feeling things are going to get worse before they get better, but I'm really hoping for a solid resolution. My understanding is that this is based on the true story of actual events. I know nothing about them. I had no context going into the story, so I have no idea how this could end, but I'm really enjoying it so far. It's my very first book by Ariel Lahan, and I'm very interested to see where it goes. And that's really all the reading updates that I have. No physical reading of Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yarrow 
house has gotten done because I was gone all day yesterday at the competition. I'm definitely feeling that today. I'm feeling sore all over the place, but I'm glad that I went and pushed myself outside of my comfort zone. Today is really all about getting things done and catching up on everything that I couldn't get done yesterday, but I really don't think that any reading of Fourth Wing is going to get done. For some reason, I have a hard time making myself sit down and read when I'm at home. I'm much more likely to do it at work during downtimes, but the problem is, is that because my next grad course starts tomorrow, all of my downtime is going to be filled with grad courses. So this is when it gets really difficult for me to actually sit down and physically read. And that's why one of my goals for this year was to really make that a priority. So I don't feel like I'm going to finish Fourth Wing this weekend like I was originally hoping to, but I definitely hope to finish it early next week. And that way I can get started on the next immersive reading that I'm going to do. All right, y'all, that's it for right now. I've got to get to filming this video because I'm also running sprints at this time. And so I want to make sure that I'm back in time for when the sprint ends. So I will chat with you later. Hi, friends. So I'm currently on my lunch break at work, and I thought it would be a good time to come on here and give you a reading slash TBR update because I did finish The Frozen River by Ariel Lahan yesterday, and I really enjoyed it. That was my first experience with Ariel Lahan, and it definitely will not be my last. And it did what I love when historical fictions can do when it really brought to life a historical figure. That's what Stephanie Dre and Laura Kamoy did with My Dear Hamilton and Eliza Hamilton, which ended up being one of my favorite books of last year. And even though Eliza Hamilton was certainly a much more well-known figure than Martha Ballard, who is the main character in The Frozen River. I still feel like Ariel Lawhon did an amazing job of bringing this person to life and really sharing her story. Now, of course, there were a lot of creative liberties that were taken in the story, and Ariel Lawhon does a great job of discussing those choices in her author's note. So if you do decide to read the story, I do also suggest reading the author's note as well, because it really ties a lot of things together. I still think that Martha Ballard was a very admirable woman, and I would have liked to know her. You know, as I mentioned in a previous clip, this is set in 1789. Martha Ballard is a respected midwife and healer in her town. She has delivered hundreds of babies. She's never lost a mother. So a lot of people really look to her for support, especially when something is going wrong medically. Prior to the start of the story, a few months prior, she was called to attend a woman named Rebecca Foster, who said that she had been raped by two men and she named her attackers and nobody believes her because at least one of them is a very well-respected man in the town. He's a judge, he's a colonel. So nobody believes that she she was raped even after she falls pregnant. And so Martha is really all about trying to get justice for this woman while also still doing her job. So you're seeing her as she's attending a lot of births, some very, very difficult births. And there's also a murder mystery because one of the men who was accused of attacking Rebecca Foster was found dead, frozen in the river. And so you're trying to figure out who did that and why. This was a very engaging novel and it was certainly extremely atmospheric. The entirety of the story is set during the winter time and it's a very cold winter. I mean, the book itself is called The Frozen River. So it's cold enough to freeze a river. So you can just kind of feel that cold, freezing, chilling temperatures. So overall, I just really enjoyed this one a lot. I thought that it was incredibly well written. And as I mentioned, I just thought that Ariel Lawhon did a fantastic job of bringing to life Martha Ballard's story. She was a woman that I had never heard of before. And her story would undoubtedly be lost to history if it weren't for her journal, because that was actually a real thing that existed. It's what inspired a nonfiction biography of Martha Ballard. And that's what Ariel Lawhon used to get a lot of the information so I'm just glad that it existed. Highly recommend if you are a historical fiction lover. So I struggled a bit with what I was going to pick up next and I'm going to get to more of that in a second but I ultimately decided to read First Lie Wins by Ashley Elston. That is a brand brand new release. It just came out and I decided to pick that up because I have a lot of new releases coming my way in book boxes and y'all know that I try to read those as soon as they come in. This is an adult thriller suspense which is different than what Ashley Elston has done in the past. She's primarily done young adult and I'm very early days into it. I only just started it but I can't tell you that we're following a woman named Evie but Evie is not actually her real name and you kind of find out pretty early on that she is not who she says she is and she's not who she's portraying to be. I don't necessarily know what she is but she seems like she's some kind of con artist. She works for a mysterious man and this man gives her a job an identity and a mark and she has to assume that identity. There's obviously something that she's trying to achieve by taking on this mark and in the story the mark that she is trying to go after is actually the person that she's in a relationship with. She's just moved in with him. Everything is going well and you can kind of tell that she's legitimately falling for this person and she's kind of starting to imagine a legitimate life for herself. But again, I don't know why she's going after this mark. I don't know what her life in the past has been like. I'm sure all of those answers will be revealed very early on in the story still. It is definitely a different vibe than what I've been reading so far this year and it's kind of taking me a minute to get into it, but I'm enjoying it so far. And really quickly before I go, I wanted to give a quick TBR update. I think I might have mentioned in a previous clip, I'm not sure, but when I pulled my challenge polls, one of the reading prompts I pulled was to read a character-driven story. And when I selected that prompt, I originally chose When We Were Bright and Beautiful by
by Jillian Medoff to satisfy it. And I think I've just come to the decision that I don't really want to read the story. There's just something about it that has made me lose interest. And I don't know why, because it should be something that's right up my alley. It seems like it's going to be a very character-driven family drama about a boy that was accused of rape. So there's going to be a lot of harder hitting elements to it, but there is just something that is pulling me away from it. I'm not excited to read it. So I've already decided to use Morgan is my name to satisfy that prompt. And I think I'm going to go ahead and unhaul when we were bright and beautiful. I don't have to, especially since I'm satisfying the prompt. So I don't have to take a punishment, but I think that I'm going to. And same with the Spanish love deception. I chose the Spanish love deception to satisfy the gameplay prompt of reading a popular book talk book. But to be honest, this is another one that for all intents and purposes, I probably would like. It's supposed to be some kind of like hate to love slash fake dating kind of romance. And it's getting a lot of really good reviews and things, but I just don't want to read it. Like I'm just not interested in reading it. And I actually picked it up yesterday after finishing the frozen river. And I got through, I think probably like the first chapter and it just, it wasn't doing much for me. And I know I hardly gave it a chance. It could be very well that I wasn't in the mood for it after all of the books that I've read so far, which are definitely more on the heavier side, I would say. And two of which have definitely been very historical in nature. So to jump from that into a more lighthearted contemporary, that could have been messing with me. I don't know y'all. It's just not something that I want to mess with right now. I don't think I'm going to be in the mood to read it for the rest of the month. And so I have decided to make Fourth Wing satisfy the prompt of reading a popular book talk book. And speaking of Fourth Wing, I am almost done with it. I have about 70 pages left. We're definitely getting to the climax of the story and I'm still enjoying it. It's not the best thing that was ever written and it's definitely not my favorite thing in the world, but it's still a really good time. I'm still invested in the story. I'm loving the relationship that's going on. Of course, I love the dragons, so I'm excited to finish it. All right, y'all, I've been chatting for way too long. I definitely need to wrap this up. So I will chat with you when I have more updates. <music> everybody. I am just about to go into the gym, but I wanted to pause for a second and update you because I finished First Lay Wins by Ashley Elston last night. I'm still debating on a rating. So I'm not sure if I gave you a thorough synopsis of this before, but basically it follows our main character, Evie Porter, although that's not really her name. She works for a man, a mysterious man named Mr. Smith, and Mr. Smith kind of gets contracted for less than savory jobs, let's put it that way. And then he has Evie along with some other people carry out the jobs for him. And so basically Evie is given a new identity, a new background, and she's given a mark. In this instance, her mark is a man named Ryan. And so she gets to know Ryan and she's in a relationship with him. And so at the beginning of the story, you're finding them as they are just moving in together. But you pretty much know from the beginning that Evie is not who she says she is. But she's starting to grow closer to Ryan. She's starting to really like him. And in the process of doing so, she's starting to imagine a life for herself that's a little bit different. But she's kind of in hot water right now with Mr. Smith because Mr. Mr. Smith thinks that she screwed up her last job and that she intentionally hid something from him and got somebody killed. And so she's kind of trying to prove herself again and so she can't really make any mistakes. But during this job, she's kind of presented with a reminder from Mr. Smith that she is easily replaceable and it freaks her out and she decides that she needs to figure out a way to take Mr. Smith down. So you're kind of following the whole progression of this as she's trying to complete her current job while she's also kind of trying to take down her boss. And at the time I have conflicted feelings about it a little bit. Not because I didn't enjoy it. Not at all. I actually had a really good time reading this book. This book was highly entertaining. It was compulsively readable. It was very well crafted. It will keep you guessing and it will definitely keep the pages turning. So there is no way that I can deny that this was an enjoyable read, a well-written read, and I had a really good time reading it. But the problem is, is that in my opinion, this is one of those books that's kind of made for the screen, right? This is a book that I feel like had I watched it as a movie, I would have enjoyed it immensely more than reading it on the page. Page. And the reason is, is because I am a character driven reader and that's not what this was. This was very fast paced. This was very plot driven. It's going from one thing to the next to the next. And I also feel like this was written in a perfect way for a movie because you're obviously following Evie Porter in the present as she's working in the current job. But then you're also flashing back to her past jobs with Mr. Smith. And I think it all would have just been perfectly played out on the big screen. And I think I would have appreciated it better as an hour and a half long movie because I still don't feel like I got enough from the book, even though I had a really great time with it. And I actually, really enjoyed the ending of it. The ending of this made me smile and it kind of tied everything up so perfectly. And it was the ending itself that really made me want to give this a four stars. And I think 
that might be what I'm leaning towards, but at the same time, I don't know how much lasting power this book has. I don't know how much of this I'm going to remember in a few days time because I don't feel like it was substantial enough, but yet I feel like it was well-crafted enough and clever enough to stick with me. So like I said, I'm kind of going back and forth on the readings a little bit. Overall, I would highly recommend this story and I would definitely be willing to read more from Ashley Elston in the future. I have since started my next read. It is Mercury by Amy Jo Burns and this is definitely more in the literary fiction side and it's kind of like a very character-driven family drama. It's following Marley and her relationship with the Joseph brothers and I think that there are going to be a lot of complex character dynamics and relationships in this story and at the beginning of the story a body is found and I think Marley, the girl, might know a little bit of something about who the body is and why the body was found in the attic of a church. So right when the body was kind of found we are flashing back to when Marley arrives in town and meets the Joseph brothers and her developing relationship with them and their family. So far it is going well and I'm really really enjoying it. All right everybody that's it that's the reading update I have to go because I have my workout peers running all the way around the building looking at me like I'm nuts so I'm gonna go and I will check in with you later. It is Saturday, January 13th, and I wanted to go ahead and wrap up the vlog because I'm trying to get it up for tomorrow. I don't have very many reading updates because I'm still in the middle of reading Mercury by Amy Jo Burns. I was hoping to have it finished by the time I closed out the vlog, but I don't want to wait that long, even though I do think I'll finish it today. But by the time I finish it, I don't know if I would have an opportunity to update you. I don't think I gave too terribly much of a synopsis in my last clip, but basically this is a very character-driven family story following multiple different characters. Primarily, we're following Marley and when she was around I want to say 17 years old she moves into the small town of Mercury I believe it's in Pennsylvania with her mother and almost immediately she's introduced and swept up by the Joseph clan which is made up of three boys a mother and a father and the father is well known in town for his roofing business and he basically expects all three of his boys to go into the roofing business and so you're kind of following the oldest boys Baylor and Waylon already following in those footsteps and you're following the complicated relationships that develop between the family and Marley because Marley is kind of introduced into the family by Baylor. She starts attending nightly dinners at their house, but then she falls for Waylon and eventually they start to get together. She winds up pregnant at 18. They have to get married and it's about their life in this family that can sometimes be toxic, especially the father who is a Vietnam vet. He has some post-traumatic stress and there's a lot of things that he does that's not really conducive to a healthy family life. You know, he barely acknowledges his wife, but the mother, Elise, is very steadfast. She's always willing to do whatever she has to do to support her husband and her sons and you can very much tell that she kind of had a lost life that there was so much more that she could be and she ultimately sacrificed all of that for her sons and Marley is now kind of going along the same path and she especially becomes kind of like a mother figure to Shay who is the youngest boy and is nine years younger than his older brothers and you kind of see her take on that maternal role and then what happens when she has a baby when the story opens it is present day timeline which is 1999 for this story there's definitely a rift between Marley and Waylon you have no idea what happened of course at this point but basically the Joseph boys are called out to fix a leaking roof at a church and when they go up into the attic they discover a body. Marley is told about the body and she's like okay well he was finally found basically so she knows who this body is and why this body is in the attic and then it flashes back to 1990 when Marley first comes to town and you're following her journey right up until the present day. So I am now into the part of the story where they are back in the present day. So I assume everything is going to kind of come to light and hopefully some things are resolved. This is definitely a character-driven story. There's not a whole heck of a lot of plot. It really is about 
about following Marley and her relationship with the Joseph boys and all of the complications that come with it. And I'm going to say that it is entirely my type of story. I am loving this immensely. I'm having a really good time reading it. I am very invested in Marley's story and her relationship with these boys and I want to see how it's going to end. At this point, I'm leading on a very strong four stars. It could potentially be upgraded depending on how it ends and how emotional I get by the ending if I do get emotional at all. It's just a really strong book. I'm very glad that I decided to pick it up. I'd never read anything by this author before, but I knew when I was reading the synopsis of it that I was going to enjoy it and I have been. So that's the final reading update of this vlog, y'all. I have edited a solid chunk of the portion of the vlog up until this point. I feel like this vlog is going to be a pretty standard expectation of what you can expect every single two weeks because these past two weeks were very standard in themselves. There was nothing notable going on in life. Between work and the start of my grad program, I was very busy. And so I picked up the camera when I could to provide updates and do a little bit of B-roll, but there's going to be more updates than B-roll because like I said, nothing notable was going on. I'm not sure how long this vlog is going to end up being, but it's probably going to end up being somewhere around the 45 minute mark. And I think that's reasonable considering it's encompassing two weeks. I see people who do weekly reading vlogs and their weekly reading vlogs sometimes reach 45 minutes to an hour every single week. So 45 minutes, I feel like is reasonable. I know that a lot of people like shorter videos, but you know, there's not much that I can do when I'm talking about multiple books at a time. And there's often chatty updates and things like that. So I hope it's okay. Please feel free to comment down below and let me know what you like to see in vlogs. Of course, I get a lot of mixed opinions. Some people want equal amounts of B-roll and updates. Some prefer more updates and less B-roll. Some people want more B-roll and more updates. I try to keep it as even as possible, but on standard weeks like this, which is going to be the vast majority of the year, it's going to be a lot harder to do more B-roll. So I hope that you're okay with that. But again, these are supposed to be like wrap-up style vlogs. So the focus really is about the books and what I'm reading and I'm taking you along elsewhere when I can. Again, please feel free to share your feedback down below. I hope that you enjoyed and I will check in with you when I start the next vlog. Bye guys. Bye.